All right, now we're again back, and where we had left off was at verse 23 with the blepete referencing a guy named Theophilus, okay, who was an iconoclast ruler. He was a little bit rabid about it. And under him, God caused the Arabs to lose again in rather uh, spectacular circumstances because like the Battle of Baraka, Theophilus didn't actually cause them to lose. They fought amongst themselves. I don't know how much you know about the ba Battle of Baraka in, in the Bible, but it, just go you know, look it up. Basically what happened was the Jews were told to stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord like they were at the Exodus, and that's what they did. They trained and trained and trained and trained for the battle, but they didn't fight in it. God did. The Arabs, in that case too, there were Arabs there, they all were going to, you know, oh, undo Jerusalem and blah, 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 blah. See, because this isn't really about Islam, it's about Arabs. All right, that's what God said back when Ishmael was born. And so this whole Arab thing later here in 839 is a similar situation. The word is, see, you got to get the whole, the, the main focus of the story here. This is about God appearing to you through his word. And the tracing of the history, whether it's in Matthew 24, 25, or Luke 21, or here in Mark 13, is about what happens when the word appears to you. First, do you get it? Secondly, when you get it, what do you do with it? Do you want it? Do you not want it? If you don't want it, then history turns bad. If you do want it, then history turns good. Well, this was a guy who apparently wanted it. And it is, and, and the other thing that's a major theme in history, and, and you can actually verify this, you know, all yourself with the history, is that when bad leaders rise, they don't rise in a vacuum. If a bad leader is at the head of a country, like right now with Donald Trump, it means that the people, it's not just because they voted for him. It could be true in a monarchy, it could be true in a, a dictatorship, like when Hitler rose. Hitler rose by means of election, too. But it doesn't have to be due to election. When a bad leader rises, it means that the people are bad. And by bad, it means they're not interested in Bible. By bad, it means that if you're not interested in Bible, I, you know, how are you going to be interested in anything else? No offense. The most important question that ought to be in your life is, where am I going to go after I die? I mean, just out of self-interest, you should be concerned with that. And so the idea of maybe God existing should be like a real important question to you personally. If it's not, or if you poo-poo it or laugh at it, or in those days they didn't poo-poo it or laugh at it, they went into religiosity about it. Oh, I'm a good person because I'm being religious. Th those are all ways of saying no to God. And you say no to God, and enough people are like that in your area, then the, there's a bad leader who rises in your area. By contrast, if a lot of people, and by a lot, it could be 10%. If like 10% of the people are interested in God, just like the, the story that, you know, um, what was it? Abraham. Abraham, when talking to God about the Sodom and Gomorrah thing, oh, if there are 10 righteous people, righteous means saved. It's a nickname for being saved. Genesis 15:6, Credited to him as righteousness. So that, that's a nickname for saved. If there are ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, you can still destroy the city. And you know, God said no. But there wasn't. There was only Lot and his wife and his kids. So it brings them out. That's a, that's a pattern of history too. Alright, but at this point, there are enough positive people in Byzantium to have a good ruler. And the Bible is located there. So if the Arabs get in, they're going to destroy those Bibles like they always have, even before Islam. If they're going to get in there, they're going to destroy those Bibles, and then people will be deprived of them. All right. So what God does is says, "Okay, I'm going to, you know, Theophilus can't really defend Byzantium against the Arabs, but he's positive to me. So I'll do a snack rib thing. I'll do a." do a battle of Baraka thing, and I'll just wipe them out. Well, how did God wipe them out? Well, he doesn't just necessarily, he can, but he doesn't always do that. He doesn't just, like, strike you. 
the fact that you're already negative to him, like the Arabs are, not all Arabs, of course, um, that means that they're gonna they're gonna have some kind of substitute God, substitute crusading, substitute politics, substitute religiosity, substitute whatever. And whenever you get into substitutes, you get into competition, you get into fighting. So here's what happened: the Arabs fought amongst themselves. Arabs love to fight. They pride themselves. It's a whole Bedouin culture of coming into somebody else's place, taking their stuff. Oh, look how good you are because you took their stuff. And maybe you kill them and maybe you rape them and maybe you take their women. And that's manliness to them. That's our culture. Indian, Indians in the, in the Americas, not all of them, but a lot of them had a similar culture. They call it counting coup. Alright, so there are peoples, whole groups of people, alright, that in history, at certain times in history, because it's not true for all the same kind of people at all the time, but there are certain groups of people at certain times in history that this is the way they think. I'm manly if I steal. I'm manly if I kill. I'm manly if I get away with something. And Trump is exactly like that. So you see, it's not restricted to Arabs or the Indians of, of the Americas. It can be in any soul. Happens to be in these Arabs at this time. And so they all fight with each other. Alright? That's how Theophilus kept his country together. That was the miracle. Alright? Now that's where we left off, and that was right here at... This 49, this 41, right here, right here at the end of Blepet Day. That's where that happened. Now after that, all right, you got other people coming into power, and the language here in Scripture gets really wacko. First of all, you got the line, see, I told you in advance. So that closes off the point, and the point, of course, being made is of a, of a, trend of history that starts in 723 and that was Leo the third all right this one is Theophilus and who comes after him they've already had advance notice in history and through the word if they knew how to read it which they would know how to read it but they weren't reading it Greek was their native tongue granted that to them this is really ancient Greek and it's hard to read for somebody speaking later. But it's no harder than it would be for us to read the King James. Alright? So they could have read it. They could have known about these syllable counts. I'm sure that someday we're going to find manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, from the first century, which will end up being papyri, that show these meter counts. It's going to happen, because why do I know about these meter counts if God isn't getting ready to roll out the actual manuscript that has them? So we'll know what we're looking at when we get it. Alright? That's what I'm thinking. Now, that's 849 here. After 849, because this is sort of like an interregnum, alright? Michael the Third ends up coming to power. And he comes to power because he's the kid of Theophilus. So it's a, it's a peaceful transition. But once he gets into power after about seven years, okay, pro e re ka hu min panta, eight years. After eight years, because that's at the beginning of 42, see, that's when our boy dies, January. So we might as well call it 41. Um, there's a sort of seven years that he gets to, to be in power, but he's not in power on his own. His mom, okay, and I forget her name, She's her name isn't Irene, but she acts like Irene, is basically running the show. So things start to go really bad, all right? Michael, ostensibly, though, is still the ruler, but he's like 10 years old or something like that, and very young. So he manages to finally overthrow his mother right here, a la Ain. A kainais five a tice. He overthrows her there. 
but he overthrows her because he because as I said in the last increment he overthrows her because he gets one of his advisors killed all right and that sets a really bad pattern for him and his last advisor who did that kind of dirty work for him was a guy named Basil all right and Basil gets all jealous because Michael the third after Basil had done all kinds of things for him all right Basil married Michael's mistress so that Michael could continue to have to to procreate with the mistress and actually have kids because that was one of his problems and then he made Basil co-emperor which Basil really liked Basil was married to Michael's mistress Michael ended up having a kid by that mistress while the mistress is married to Basil maybe and we're not really 100% sure but the big sin in Basil's eyes that Michael did is Michael liked another advisor better so Basil had Michael killed at the end of 867 which is right here okay the text covering that whole period including his overthrow of his mother through murder is but in those days after the tribulation that one and it's like why are you likening that to a tribulation okay I mean it's, it's like what and then it gets even more crazy because the language says in this in the sun Hohelios Scotizo Scoti Tesete Tai Scotitesetai Darkens Kai and Hey the Selene Selene Moon U won't doesn't not Dose give to the Thegos Autis. Okay, right here at Thegos. Right here in the middle of the word. You'll notice that it, there's three syllables after it. So this is eight eighty nine minus three eight eighty six. That is when Basil dies. His the kid that was supposed to be his wife that was really Michael's mistress had a kid and there's a question of whether it was Michael's kid or Basil's kid that guy's name was called to history Leo the fourth or Leo the Leo the fifth Leo the fifth or sixth we'll get to him in a minute he ends up taking over at that point and he and his dad his ostensible dad Basil never got along ba Basil's light get this this word means light see the moon not give its you toe is really a definite article but you can translate it as possessive light hers because Selene is a female noun all right light in the middle of the word light the lights go out on Basil do you see the wit there in the middle of the light the lights go out on Basil in the middle of the word light his lights go out now he had a pretty nasty end he dies of a sickness of some kind nobody knows they like to think or they like to tell you that um, first of all that Basil was a good ruler which he really wasn't and they like to tell you that um, Basil died because he was heart sick that his favorite son Constantine died instead of Leo who was the guy who ends up inheriting the, the emperorship because Basil dies there that, that Constantine died sometime before Basil died and Basil just never recovered from that and therefore he got sick and he died in 886 which is depicted there by this middle of the word Phagos okay now however he died he didn't get murdered however he died whatever he died he's dead now his lights are out but what's really remarkable about this whole stretch of text is that it's depicting 
Basil's reign as the sun darkening and the moon not giving its light. But if you talk to historians, or especially if you talk to the Greek Orthodox, because they like to glorify their emperors too, they say, oh, this was the greatest time. Basil united everybody and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, but the Bible doesn't think that that's such a good idea. Why? Well, if you go read up on Basil, which maybe you've done already, you find out, oh, he tried to do a rapprochement with our friend, uh, the, the popes in, the, in Rome. And he tried to do a rapprochement with, with uh, uh, what was it, Louis II or whoever was ruling the Holy Roman Empire at that time. They were trying to unite. Okay, but see, the big problem is that if you got a guy who's claiming to be the head of the church, ruling over the church, uniting with another guy who claims to be the head of the church, although in the West they didn't call it that way, the papacy was separate, then what's going to happen to the Bible? It's going to go down. The sun, light of scripture, darkens, and the moon doesn't give its light. It's a threat to scripture. It was just like the Tower of Babel. This has been the same story scripture has been telling since Genesis. Do not unite church and state. And we have the very same problem right now in Washington, in the White House. The group backing Trump is Seven Mountains, and their whole goal is to unite church and state in total contravention to the Constitution. And to justify that treasonous action to themselves, they claim that the Constitution never meant to separate church and state. I don't know about you, but it's pretty obvious to me that if there's no rule that Congress can make respecting religion, that's separation of church and state. And it says that in our Constitution. But, if they, but they're reversing Revelation 17, so why not reverse the Constitution? Revelation 17 has a phrase in it called Seven Mountains. And they're reversing what Revelation 17 says, which is a condemnation of uniting church and state. The Mosaic Law was not a uniting of church and state. It was a separation. Moses was the state. Aaron, his brother was the religion. Aaron did not have any state powers. Moses didn't have any priestly powers. I don't know, I, you know, I, you have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to read that. Alright, well they are deaf, dumb, and blind, and this is what he's talking about, is everybody's going to be blinded because they're going dark. The sun darkens and the moon won't give its light. That's the first meaning. Is by trying to unite the West and the East, you're going to be crushing the freedom of Bible to move in either direction. Because so long as they're not united, so long as there's competition, then there is a motive on behalf of the secular rulers and the religious rulers to leave you alone. Because they don't know if they're going to need you as allies against one of their enemies. That's the beauty of competition. So, yeah, you're a Bible reader, and yeah, we hate you, and we think you're a heretic, but we're not going to do anything, because what if we need you to help us against some Arab that's invading, or some, you know, Goth that's invading, or some somebody else that's invading? So we're going to leave you alone, but we hate you. Okay, fine, hate me. Just leave me alone. Alright? So once they get all united under one head, which was the attempt that was made by Diocletian that Constantine actually consummated, but it's broken up now, if they go back to that, it's really bad. And going back to that is exactly what this meter is telling you. Because there's a 511 distance between the time of Constantine, which is right here at 298, and 209. So when Theophilus dies, the trend of going back to Constantine starts up again. Which is illustrated by... Michael's mom trying to take over everything and unite everything under her. And then, of course, he overthrows her, thanks to Basil and others, right here. But then Basil, okay, then Basil gets upset, murders Michael III here, and then Basil himself dies here. Basil was the one trying to unite everything under one head. Basil was like 
trying to be Diocletian. Basil actually talked like and said he wanted to emulate Justinian the first. Justinian the first is the guy who brought the Byzantine Empire to its greatest extent and was one of the most evil rulers we ever had. He, cre he created a code which was basically, you know, if you aren't part of my brand of Christianity, then you have to die. That's what his code says. You can read it yourself at 4thCentury.com. It's horrible. And it, it's all over the place in the internet, in Latin. I want to say also in Greek. But it's translated also into English. It's horrible. The Justinian Code is what it's called. Basil wanted to take everybody back to that. So do you see why the Lord is using such bad language? And the sun is dark and the moon won't give out her light. Yeah. Because you're going to try and, and, and tyrannize everybody over how they should study scripture. No, no. Because what that's going to end up leading to is if your version of Christianity is different from my version of Christianity. And you have a Bible. Well, I'm going to think that you tainted that Bible somehow and I'm going to destroy it. Well, then that means that scripture is less available to the whole. You see the point? It's really bad. That's why this language is really bad. Now, there's another meaning to it that's satirical right here. And that is, oh, oh, our boy Basil has died. This Greek drama is really very melodramatic. I hate it, actually. It's witty, but it's also melodramatic. Hi, hi. There's always some chorus chanting these too many words thing. Oh, with the gods, the sun and the moon, and the, the sun and the moon have now gone out of our life because Basil has died. That's the point. The sun is darkened now and the moon won't give out her light because the light of our life who made our empire great again, Basil is dead. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, I. So he's making fun of what they're going to say about Basil at that point. Okay. They're real proud of themselves because under Michael III, what ended up happening is the evangelization of the Bulgars, the Moravians, and the Russians. So they're like, see, see, we're right. They all believe in the same thing we do. So therefore, we're right. More numbers means better. More numbers means more right. Yeah, where have you heard that before? So Basil comes to the throne and they're like, oh, see, we're the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then Basil wants to unite with the West. And it's like, yeah, 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 empire, 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 empire. And then he dies. Oh, why, why? Oh, the sun is darkened now and the moon won't give out her light because the light of our life, Basil, our empire, our emperor, dies. And there's no such thing as Christianity without the emperor. That was actually a saying at the time. Can you imagine? Christianity is it only exists because of the emperor? Whatever happened to Christ? So you see, they were really already darkened. The sun of their life was already darkened, as so when. And the moon of their life was already darkened. And so it's not giving out any light. You see? So that's why that's valid. Now following Basil was the son he didn't like, who might have been Michael III's kid, Leo. And Leo rules until 912, which brings us down here seven syllables short. Okay, which is kind of funny, because this is salute son tai, five syllables. This means shaken, like like an earthquake shaken. <coughs> okay, and this is uranois. Okay, Leo dies right here. See, because, well, no, he dies right here, right? Let's see. Ranoi salute son taya. Leo dies right here at U. Now in Greek, the word U means not. <coughs> so, yep, he's not. He's not here anymore. Whether he went up to heaven, see, Uranois means to heaven. Whether he went to heaven or not, who knows. I, it's likely that he did believe that Jesus Christ paid for his sins at some point because he heard about him all his life. So he might have gone to heaven. See his date of case, so it means to. To heaven. 
classical Greek they didn't use prepositions, so they just changed the case ending to mean the preposition. So that would be to heaven in classical Greek. And just cut off here at ooh, not <coughs> So he is not anymore. And the heavens are shaken. Yeah, that's what people will be saying about him when he dies. In the overdramatic Greek way of overdramatizing things, the Romans were just as bad. And the powers and of the heavens are all shaken like an earthquake. Right here, though, is when he died. So the heavens and being shaken is occurring after he dies. Well, what happened after he dies? Well, he had a kid through his mistress, which the head of Constantinople of priesthood didn't like. Well, the priest, the head of the priesthood liked the kid, but didn't like the fact that Leo, who had really bad luck in marriages, he didn't like the fact that Leo had, had married this other woman in 901. And the stories about this disagreed violently. Leo married his mistress in 901. The reason he married his mistress in 901, this is really sad. The previous three women that he married, they all die. It's kind of like, oh, if you're going to marry Leo, you're going to die. So let's have him, I'd rather be your mistress instead, okay? Okay, but he may, but the, the the three women die, and so he's got to marry a fourth one. And he says, "Well, to hell with this! I'm just going to marry my mistress. She's been his mistress all along. I want to marry her." Well, the priest at the time, named uh, Nicholas Mystikos, cra crazy name, um, he said, "No, no, no, not going to consecrate your marriage in 901. Sorry." And Leo said, okay, fine, I'm deposing you and I'm putting somebody else in your pet place. He married her, he has his kid. And that's born, the kid is born four, five years, four years later, in 905. The kid's name is Constantine the Seventh. makes him co-emperor almost right away. And Constantine, therefore, at this moment that Leo dies in 912, comes to power. But he's a kid. He's a little kid. So now we have to enter verse 26, and what happens as a result of that, and I'll cover that in the next increment. Isn't this a soap opera?